So welcome. Uh, my name is Laura Sherberg. I run the Gender Institute at Royal Holloway. We're thrilled to uh, be hosting this event with the LSE Gender Studies Department. Uh, so we're happy to see faces from both places here. Um, and before we get started, I want to give a shout out to uh, the organizer from Royal Holloway, Kavita Maya, um, which without whom this would never have happened. Um, and also to the support that we've gotten both from Royal Holloway and from LSE, which has been amazing. And of course, you've also seen the Assistant Director of the Gender Institute, Josephine, wandering around making sure we all made it here, including me. Um, but I am pleased to uh, introduce this event on the Politics and Possibilities of Feminist Knowledge Production. Uh, we have three speakers today who are going to talk about different parts of the politics and possibilities of feminist knowledge production. And then we hope that the fourth speaker is you, um, so that we can have a long and detailed conversation about it. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled to have all of you here. Um, and I will start by turning the floor over to our first speaker, Dr. Kat Gupta, uh, who is a lecturer in political communication and an affiliate of the Gender Institute at Royal Holloway. And I will let other introductions go to you and turn over the floor and hit the PowerPoint button. All right, thank you very much, Laura. So hello, I'm Kat, I use they, them pronouns, so, and I put my email address and Twitter handle up there. If you would like to take photos and stuff, that's fine. Okay, take it away, bottom presser. Okay, so this is going to be a bit of a departure from what I normally talk about because what I thought about is rather than talk so much about my research, what I would prefer to talk about is the context in which this research was done. So I'm going to focus more on the production side. So the questions that I'm interested in are, what are the conditions under which I research? What are the conditions in which this knowledge is generated and produced? And I'm doing, going to talk mainly about challenges. So things that have, basically, things that have not gone well for me. So just as a brief background, I am a corpus linguist and discourse na analyst by training. But in reality, I'm pretty much interdisciplinary in every direction you can think of. And I'm currently in a politics department, which is perhaps not quite where I expected to end up, but I'm very happy to be there. And my current research projects are on the media representation of trans people and on online erotica, which sound very different. And I will tell you why I'm doing work on both of them. So. Yeah, so these are some of the major challenges that I've come up against in my work as a feminist academic. So some of these are to do with conflicting agendas and the political climate in which I work. Some of it is to do with research and mental health. Some of it is to do with precarity and being a precarious labor with laborer within the academy. And some of it is to do with funding models, which is the thing that I'm currently bumping up against. Sorry, Laura. <laughs> okay. So, as people who are interested in feminist research, I probably don't have to tell you that we are in a challenging climate for it, that the political climate within the UK is distinctly unfriendly towards a lot of the work that I at least am trying to produce. This might be the same for you as well. There is a general emboldening of global far right movements and networks, and we can see that these networks are globally distributed, that they're talking to each other and they're taking ideas from each other. So the things that are popping up in, say, uh, Florida with book bans and the things that are popping up in Orban's Hungary with the closing of gender studies departments are things that are also having an impact in the UK. There are increased levels of hate crimes, particularly those affecting LGBTQ populations. And this takes place in that political context where people are emboldened to turn the words of, of uh, far right influences into action. 
there is a general undermining of equality legislation and organisations intended to protect human rights. And then there is this discourse of the culture wars, which often serves as a distraction of getting people really angry and hateful and fired up about something while the government basically strip away the NHS. So there's a real potential for the work that I do to attract the attention of groups who are hostile to the kind of populations and questions and people that I'm interested in. And the point I want to make here is that people are not inherently vulnerable, but they're made vulnerable by the structures and the society around them. So there's nothing saying if you have a disability, you're inherently vulnerable. It's the society around you that fails to support you in that disability that makes you so. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that I've been turning over in my mind is there are questions that I want to ask that might not be good to, uh, or safe to ask in this climate. So should, what do we do if we're interested in some of these questions that marginalized and vulnerable groups do? But if we then go on to research these, are we actually giving people who seek to harm these groups more material? So some of the things I've been thinking about are things like, trans people accessing medical care. Medical care in the UK is particularly is highly gatekept and the kind of hoops that one has to jump through at gender clinics are basically posited on a very stereotypical outdated model of binary gender. So lots of, lots of people, trans people, get together and swap strategies for how do you jump through these hoops. How and I, I do know one group of butch lesbian trans women who had a skirt within their group, and they all swapped this skirt around for so whoever was going to have to see a clinician wore the skirt, <laughs> and that was so you could perform femininity to someone who didn't really have a good understanding of what uh, queer lesbian femininity would look like. So I could explore these strategies that groups explore, but then is someone going to take that research and use it to deny treatment to people? There are similar issues with people who are seeking abortions or reproductive medical care, such as uh, um, hysterectomies. So the kind of things that you have to do and say in order to be the ideal patient within this medical system. There are strategies that refugees and asylum seekers use when attempting to cross borders. So how do people find out how to cross a border? How do they, how do they find out which groups are willing to take an awful lot of money to smuggle you across and so on? So there are these strategies and these networks of information that people want to keep secret for a very, very good reason. Uh, similarly with people, escaping abuse such as domestic abuse or modern slavery, there are probably there are probably groups and networks and, and kind of people that you can talk to who will help you. But a lot of this work has to be for the safety of their participants be kept very secret. So if you research these things, you're kind of dragging this stuff out into the open, which might be quite dangerous for the people involved. So something that kind of links to that is this idea of research and mental health. We often focus on researching harm and conflict and sometimes really distressing, upsetting stuff because that's kind of what, what outsiders find interesting. So there's a kind of secondary trauma that can come from that, that even if you're not in a group who is directly affected by these things, uh, you can be, you, if you're reading these accounts of people undergoing incredibly traumatic experiences, then you can start feeling a, a distress because of that. However, there's a real lack of support for researchers who are working on the difficult material. NHS cuts mean that mental health services are already overstretched 
and private therapy is often financially unviable. So I know that when I was a PhD student, I certainly couldn't afford to hand over quite a big chunk of my money to someone else. And then universities tend seem to acknowledge, yeah, okay, we might have a problem here, but the way they seem to approach it is through this very individualized sense of, of, of well-being. And quite frankly, if I'm reading stuff about violent transphobia, I'm not convinced that going to a couple of meditation sessions is going to help. Okay. Um, an issue tied into that is one of precarious labour. So there's this expectation of several years between PhD completion and a permanent full-time post. And this happened to me, finished my PhD in 2013, didn't actually get a permanent post until uh, 2017. So that meant that I spent an awful lot of time bouncing around between teaching fellowships and research fellowships that were sometimes as short as three months and hourly paid work. So this means that you have a real sense of, of kind of urgency of, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to be doing in six months time or in 12 months time. And it means that you have to put your life on hold that you don't know where you're going to settle down. You can't settle down. Your next job might demand that you move halfway across the country that the networks of support that you've built for yourself are constantly being disrupted. You can't think about a future, so a house that you, or a flat that you actually own, or children, or really long-term enduring relationships because you don't know where you're going to be, and if your partner will tolerate being dragged halfway across the country yet again. So we need to think about who has the social and financial capital to survive these years. So who has the kind of stability, perhaps the family support, perhaps uh, inherited money and those sorts of things to be able to survive that. And therefore, who gets kind of winnowed out of this? So whose voices do we lose because this is a hurdle that we shouldn't have to overcome? And unfortunately, even the prospect of a permanent contract isn't always enough. So this photo is me packing up my office after uh, Roehampton basically closed most of its depart a lot of its departments and said, you either can take voluntary redundancy or we'll make you redundant. So I basically packed up, I basically took the voluntary redundancy and said, fine, okay, I'm out, and packed up my office and basically pieced out. But it means that in the face of department closures across the sector, so it's not just a Roehampton problem, it's De Montford, it's Wolverhampton, it's Aston, uh, where else? You can probably name more that to a greater or lesser degree, we are all a little bit precarious. We all have that hanging over us of, uh, what is my job going to still be here in three years time? So again, feeding into that is this, are funding mod models. They are intensely competitive that of all of the things, all of the applications and proposals that get funded, a very small percentage of them actually do get the funding. So there's this pressure to produce work and ideas that is innovative and world leading. And sometimes you don't quite have that idea. Sometimes you need to do a smaller thing that might lead into a bigger thing, or you might have, um, you might have something that is just really, really focused on quite a small population that perhaps isn't going to be considered of global impact, but is hugely important for that small group. And there's something about the work of having to imagine a research project. So when you write out your funding application, you're doing that work of imagining a project existing. You're doing, you're kind of investing in it. You're investing in I want to see this thing work. I want to be able to plan out for the next five years what I'm going to do. I want to be able to offer 
uh, postdoc to someone that will at least give them some stability and so on, but then it doesn't get funded. So you so you kind of go through this process of imagining and it being stopped and imagining and it being stopped and that can be it's tiring. Uh, there's also a cycle where people with funding often have time to work on further funding proposals. So these interact in complex and sometimes un unanticipated ways. So things like if you do get attacked, is your department or your funding body going to support you? So, for example, I've had to have a talk with my line manager before about hey, so there's kind of this transphobic pile on, on me on Twitter at the moment. And uh, you, might have, you might have to expect that there's going to be some fairly nasty emails coming into the department questioning my abilities, qualifications, et cetera, et cetera. Can I trust that they're going to do that and trust that they're going to have my back? There's, what happens if you are a precarious worker? What happens if you don't have that long term uh, sense of stability? Can you carry out upsetting and work on upsetting and difficult topics under difficult and stressful conditions? So this is actually why the erotica pro project started up. I was doing a lot of work on um, on media transphobia and just reading lots and lots of really, really awful things. And then my co-investigator co said, hey, Kat, I've got 1.4 billion words of online porn. Do you want to do you want to do something with this? And when that happens, you say, yes, right. <laughs> so I did. And it became my my kind of fun project. Of course, we then made it not fun because guess what? There was a bunch of transphobia in that as well. But it was it is my kind of fun project on the side. And then this idea of how can you imagine a, your future research plans if you don't actually know that there's a future in academia for you? Okay. So where does the feminism come in? So we are working under these incredibly difficult conditions when thinking about the knowledge that we're producing. So one of the things that I found really valuable from feminism is this focus on intersectionality, of focusing where are the intersections and who is most affected by these structures. I've also found Ruth Pierce's work on uh, dealing with marginalization as a methodological issue. So it's not just an individual problem. It's not something that's an issue with the researcher. It's in fact a problem of methods. It's a problem that if you are marginalized, you're not, you're often not placed in the position where you can work. And she suggests a couple of, of uh, directions to take. Or if you could. Yes, sorry about that. No problem. So she, she talks about the responsibility that we have for ourselves. So we have a responsibility to ourselves as researchers that we have to take care of ourselves because in some cases no one else is going to. So we need this emotional reflexivity of acknowledging and articulating and working through our emotional responses. So something that she's found particularly useful is keeping very detailed fieldwork diaries that record her emotions and record what she's thinking and feeling about things as well as what she's observing and, and uh, kind of researching. She, we talked a lot about a com supportive community of scholars and I argue that this can happen outside the bounds of the more traditional networks in academia and in some cases it has to. So things like social media, Twitter is a bit of a bin site at the moment, it's kind of terrible. But for example, I have a Discord server of other people working in similar areas, and it's become a really nice source of support. I think in, in addition to the two things that Ruth talks about, we need to recognise how we can be exploited. So feminism tends to attract people who are intensely interested in social justice, and who genuinely care. And unfortunately, that care can be exploited. 
that feminists as people, we tend to want to hold other people up. We tend to want to support them. If we have a student in distress, our instinct is to help that student rather than say, ooh, not in my workload model, can't do that. But unfortunately, these things can be exploited. And one of the things about the neoliberal academy is that it kind of seeks out these fault lines and it seeks out these areas of softness and tenderness where it might be and it might it kind of utilizes it so a really important thing i think is putting boundaries in place that at some point we need to think about what we can actually say yes to and we need to be firm about what we say no to so that i think there has to be some kind of sense that we can say no to things and these things and it might be hard and it might affect our professional trajectory but at the same time we're not just kind of like good little academic typewriter monkeys at some point we need to say we need to protect ourselves simultaneously we need to recognize where we hold power and how we use it so particularly as i kind of move up that uh, greasy greasy pole i mean i'm increasingly aware that i do have a limited amount of power and that this might grow and change in forms but how am i using it am i using it to make sure that other people are supported am i using it to make change am i using it to somehow enforce some kind of structural changes so that these things don't become individual problems so I think that's where I want to leave it for now. Let's just check. Yep, that's where I want to leave it. Uh, as you can see, super well prepared and organized. And I hope that I've given you some stuff to think about and which Kavitha and Aiko will be able to talk about as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, all right, I'm going to get up the next set of slides and then do the introducing because then I'll look like I'm very cool. Um, you are very cool. <laughs> I think that's empirically not true, but since I don't believe in empirics, I'm going to go with it anyway. Uh, all right, uh, Kavita, you're next, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I think I just shared it. Yes, okay. The camera catches this part, but not that. The camera's so looking at me the whole time? Yes, oh, that's a, that's a hard <laughs> um, All right, so I'm going to go sit over there, and then we'll do better. OK, so um, Kavita Maya is Research and Outreach Fellow at the Gender Institute at Royal Holloway. And we are pleased to listen to her talk, which I'm going to put in slideshow mode now, because I think I do know how to do that. All right. Yay. Okay, so my talk is Feminist Web, Lifelines and Wonderlines. First slide, please. So in my segment, I'm gonna be waxing lyrical about spider webs as a kind of metaphor or tool to think with a feminist theorizing. And this is really um, drawing on certain tropes and certain kinds of white feminist theory. And I use them and I kind of subvert them and use them as an epistemic tool to think through epistemic violence and embodied geopolitics of knowledge. And really what I'm trying to do with this um, theorizing about spiderwebs is really pick on two interwoven, interrelated ideas or kind of provocations or ideas that we can use for further discussion. So one of them is the persistence of colonial white feminism in academic spaces and in scholarship. And the possibilities and limitations of using theory to disrupt its disciplinary power. And of course that changes across disciplines. So I've had different experiences of white feminism and white feminist theory in gender studies in sociology and political science and in the study of religions. And also I want to think a little bit about the relationship between language and politics, language and activism, and theory and practice. There's a slight time delay, I'm sorry. So it's I'm hitting it when you say it. That's totally fine. Um, so why why am I thinking about spiderwebs? So spiderwebs come up in particular kinds of feminist ideas that you might associate with 1970s and 80s feminist discourse. But I think it's quite important to note that these ideas don't just um, occur in the past, they're also in the present. 
So, for example, feminist writers, literary theorists, self-identified witches, goddess spirituality practitioners draw on the language of spinning, weaving and spider webs as a metaphor to think about women's creative agency in opposition to the techno-patriarchal narratives of history and culture. Um, you might find these kind of metaphors coming up in ideas like the web of life as a metaphor of organic interconnection and spiritual spaces. And this idea of spider webs and the web of life, web of life goes all the way back to um, well, feminist literary tradition, which draws on Ovid's tale of Arachne in Roman times. So in Ovid's Metamorphosis, he writes about Arachne as a figure who was a skilled and famed weaver who refused to credit the goddess Athena with her divine weaving skill. And she challenged um, the goddess Athena to a contest at the loom. And Athena, in her rage and jealousy, accepted. And both the goddess and the mortal woman um, wove tapestries at the loom. And while Athena's tapestry depicted a uh, story of the Olympian gods and all their majesty kind of supporting the hegemonic regime, Arachne's story depicted the gods in their misdeeds, especially their um, violence against mortal women, and kind of portrayed in a very irreverent kind of light. And Athena was forced to concede that Arachne's skill was superior and that her, tap her tapestry had more meaning and you know, was more powerful. Um, Athena was jealous and in a rage, she struck Arachne with her shuttle and in Ovid's tale, in order to get away from Athena, Arachne tried to hang herself and at that moment, um, Athena took pity on her and transformed her into a spider. So she goes from being someone who is a skilled and widely recognised weaver who can spin tapestries depicting stories and narratives that can be recognised by everyone, to a figure who is weaving sort of dusty cobwebs in the corners of rooms and is unintelligible. And I use the figure of Arachne to think about practices of silencing. So it's not so much that Arachne can't signify through her webs, it's more that she's not listened to, she can't be heard, she's being silenced and she won't be received on equal terms by um, the goddess and by the Olympian pantheon. So it's really a story about epistemic silencing and marginalisation, in my view, or in my reading of it. Um, and feminist literary critics and theorists love the story of Arachne because it's about challenging patriarchal dominance and sort of dominant stories and there's also an etymological link between the word text and the Latin verb textere which means to weave also linking to um, textus which means woven and textura the web texture or structure so there is an etymological link between weaving and text and women right, um, women um, feminist theorists draw on these theories of writing to talk about women's authorship and their creative agency, writing against the grain, although it should be noted that they mean this in the singular sense. So women's creative agency in the Arachnean sense, where Arachne is opposing patriarchal dominance and patriarchal narratives, embodied by the figure of Athena, who is identified with the law of the father. So examples of these white feminist texts, um, some of you might know Mary Daly's writing, she was a feminist theologian in the 1970s, well, she published Gynecology in the 1970s, and she was a huge part of the women's spirituality movement, part of a trend or a tradition that saw um, women theologians, feminist theologians, rejecting the idea of God the Father in favour of um, a matriarchal mother goddess as a means to um, retrieving women's empowerment. So Mary Daly redefines spinsters. Um, which normally means, you know, unmarried women. It's a, it's a stigmatizing term for unmarried women coming back from them, um, going back ages. And she sees them as radical feminist agents with the power to spin and weave new trans historical possibilities. And she draws on organic natural metaphors like the web of life, um, like spinning and weaving spiders, like dolphins, you can kind of transcend historical boundaries. But she all does this in a way that reasserts organic biological female femaleness. So her rhetoric is quite anti trans. She specifically rejects any notion that gender um, can be a technology and can be technologized in order to try to transform people's understanding of their own gender identity. Um, her writing also influenced the Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp in the 1980s, where activists wove webs of wool around the nuclear um, cruise missile site in order to protest patriarchal militarism. So it was this, this idea of like positing the web of life and its organic interconnections um, in opposition to patriarchal nuclear missile. But interestingly, the kind of politics that materializes through these discourses is what I'm most interested in. So there were also racial conflicts at the Green and Common Women's Peace Camp. I think in the late 1980s, 
for instance, a group of women from King's Cross, a group of black feminist activists from King's Cross, that is, um, were very frustrated at the lack of recognition of black feminist politics and the demands that black feminists were making as a piece of and they staged a takeover of one of the gates at Greenham Common. And in the writings from this time, and in some academic accounts of that um, peace camp and the activism in it, they were portrayed as sort of aggressive and divisive and, you know, splitting apart the kind of harmonious, organic, natural life of the women's peace camp with their angry demands for equality, for racial equality. Similar kinds of discourses are found in um, literary theories like Mad Women in the Attic by Sandra Gilbert and Susan Gruber, who, for instance, characterized the poet Emily Dickinson as a kind of marginalized Arachnid figure who was, spinning po who was spinning poetic tapestries with a yarn of pearl in the shadows of her father's house. And they link her whiteness and her fondness for the color white to the white threads of her poetic metaphors. And they link that to Victorian, to her Victorian purity and um, femininity. And it's a very kind of colonial era kind of image. Another spider theory that I draw on is Nancy Miller's essay, Arachnologies. And this is where I get with my own work on feminist arachnid politics, which I'll talk about in a moment. So Nancy Miller draws on the figure of arachne in opposition to what she sees as post-structuralism's erasure of gender subjectivity. She thinks that post-structuralist theories like the death of the author in Roland Barthes' work, for instance, um, erase women's subjectivity. So Barthes says the text is a tissue or a web with an indeterminate multiplicity of meanings. Interpretations can be multiple. Um, it opens the way for many more interpretations for, you know, and this lays the groundwork for theories like Judith Butler's theory of gender performativity, which draws on Foucault and other post-structuralist theorists like Barthes. And he rejects the idea that there is any one author God of a particular text. So texts can be reconfigured, they can be rewoven and resignified. Nancy Miller disagrees with this, however, and she's arguing that emphasizing the spider's web over the spider reproduces the Freudian association of women with a fundamental lack. So he, he sees women as you know, not able to be signified, not able to be subjects because they lack a penis. So women and lack, there is a um, central association in psychoanalytic theory. Um, and Miller is arguing that this allows male authors, readers and writers to stage women as rhetorical objects, not as real living people, as fantasy objects whose difference, whose subjectivity, whose agency and whose creativity is ignored. So she takes issue with post-structuralism for that reading, reading, reason. Next slide. Okay, is it? Oh. Yes, that is, sorry. So is there a spider in the text? Miller's arachnology as a reading and writing practice um, argues that arachnology can be a critical positioning which reads against the weave of indifferentiation to discover the embodiment and writing of a gendered subjectivity. So she's arguing over reading into history and to feminist writing for a female authentic signature to counter what she sees as the under reading of female agency, creativity and authorship in patriarchal history and textual narratives. But of course, this, this search for a kind of authentic biological femaleness or this kind of authentic female signature tends to foreclose any recognition of gender performativity or queerness or recognitions for racial difference or difference in general. So kind of, it forecloses all these kind of you know, performative, um, difference-focused readings of gender and race that we need in order to forge liberatory struggles. So what kind of politics follows on from Miller's arachnology and from these kind of spider theories that I'm talking about? So one example um, that I heavily concentrated on in my work is the goddess movement. So it's a women's spirituality movement that developed alongside um, secular feminism in the 1970s and 80s. It's a largely white women's movement and it draws heavily on um, myths and cultures from um, Asia, Africa and the Americas. Next slide, please. Um, as well as searching for a kind of authentic pre-Christian, prehistoric, indigenous, British and European goddess culture. So the search for an ancient matriarchal culture. And in this, you can kind of see that um, there is a reading into the past of a kind of um, a female signature in the divine sense, like a female author goddess beneath the webs, of, um, the cobwebs of patriarchal history. Um, the goddess movement draws very heavily on sort of 
appropriated practices. So there's a lot of kind of Native American drumming going on, a lot of women wearing sari fabrics and bindis and kind of dressing up as racialized others in order to kind of promote ideas about empowerment and spiritual transgression um, in a way that is very reminiscent of Bell Hook's essay, um, Eating the Other. From 1992, her, look, her book on um, black looks and representation, where she talks about racialized ethnicity as the spice for white cultural regeneration. Um, goddess feminist discourse in particular emphasizes a primitive dark mother um, as a kind of spiritual agent of transformation and power for reclaiming white European indigeneity and white women, um, white women's divine subjectivity and spiritual empowerment. And these are heavily colonial ideas that draw on 19th century colonial philosophical discourse, where ideas about a world mother are kind of uh, promoted by Helena Blavatsky based on ideas about Indian motherhood and Indian religion. Um, in my field work on the goddess movement, I came across narratives like women are the colonized, women as a group are the indigenous and the colonized. Um, some white women were very um, focused on the idea of reclaiming white women's roots. And again, there was this idea about um, wanting to reclaim ancient prehistoric European and British white indigenous goddesses as if they were reminiscent or kind of a mirror image of like Native American goddesses or Indian goddesses. Again, it's kind of projection onto the past that's heavily racialized. And the image there is a painting by Monica Schur, who's, um, who was a Swedish born artist who was very heavily active in the women's spirituality movement in the 70s and 80s and also in socialist feminist spaces in Britain. And this painting, God Giving Birth, caused quite a stir when she exhibited it in the late 1960s and early 70s. But interestingly, she talks about this figure as being um, not a white woman and also not sexually pleasing to men. But as you can see in the painting, body of the, of the goddess or the woman that she's painted is a white woman and there is this kind of like weird abstraction with the face so it's like a half black half white mask like figure that doesn't really have anything to do with living black and brown women as living subjects but it's kind of like an abstracted heavily racialized and I think quite appropriated image. So my argument when I go from feminist arachnology to kind of conceptualizing this idea of arachnid politics is that much like the way Daly and the goddess movement and white women writers, um, sorry, much like the way that patriarchal writers stage women as rhetorical objects, white women writers, Mary Daly and goddess spirituality discourse does the same kind of thing to racialize women, um, black women and women of color. So women of color are staged as rhetorical objects, drained of their subjective life and agency and their racialized and gendered living differences. And I think instead of looking at the web of life as an organic metaphor of interconnection. You can think about the web as a symbol of, you know, a space of violence, basically. I'm emphasizing the notion of disconnection and difference. For instance, when we talk about race, it, it immediately introduces notions of discomfort, of division, of difference, because it makes visible experiences of inequality which women don't share, which is very much in opposition to the kind of romanticized idea of harmony and interconnection and sort of peace loving narratives in women's spirituality and in the 1980s women's peace movement. So in arachnid politics, I'm saying that the spider's web can be reconfigured to think about the ways that interconnection always entails predatory relationships of power and inequality. For example, as between white feminists and trans exclusive radical feminists and women of color and trans people and the way they kind of predate on the living subjectivities of marginalized women. And in order to get from arachnology to arachnid politics, I relied very heavily on um, women of color and black feminist theory, which to me kind of constituted an epistemic um, shift in my kind of horizons during my research. So I went from focusing on my field work and theories and writings by white goddess women and white feminists to looking at the ways that um, writers like, you know, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, Sarah Ahmed, Heidi Muir, to name just a few, focus on the difference embodied by you know, racialized women and how it's important to center that difference when we kind of create our theories in order to forge spaces where we can think about emancipatory struggle and kind of make visible experiences and the politics of violence that occurs all around us. I really like the way that Heidi Mirza and Yasmin Gunaratnam talk about women of color and black feminist texts as lifelines because I think it emphasizes the way that um, we are often in a hostile space. So it's this idea of Black feminist lifelines as you know, um, enabling ideas to be transmitted forward 
enabling survival of ourselves and also of our ears. But also there's kind of an um, acknowledgement there that we are kind of writing against the white feminist grain, writing against epistemic hostility. I think as Kat very beautifully illuminated in her talk earlier. There is a history of um, spider webs being used to think about colonial power dynamics. So this is like an image of um, a 1915 German propaganda poster where Britain is depicted as a colonial spider, ensnaring its European rivals and consuming more and more um, territory across the world on the world map. And I think about my own refiguring of the romantic spider web in a kind of arachnopolitical vein where I'm centering the politics of violence and silencing practices as being about epistemic disobedience, with a particular nod for Dr. Tammy Wilkes, who pushed me in this direction a couple of weeks ago at a workshop. So, for instance, Walter Mignolo talks about epistemic violence, sorry, epistemic disobedience, as um, a form of decolonial thinking that presupposes delinking epistemically and politically from the web of imperial knowledge. And again, there's kind of the implicit idea of the web as being something all encompassing, having many nodes, having many linkages, but also something that can be a site of predation and violence. Finally, um, with the spider's web, I want to emphasize how there is always a hole at the center of the web. And when I think of the hole at the center of the um, image of the spider's web, I remember this um, quotation by Teresa de Loretis that I really like, where she talks about the hint of silence at the heart of language and the, necess the, necess the necessity to avoid imperialism, to avoid single ways of knowing to enable wonder lines that lead us from institutionalizing structures to other ways of knowing, to remain open to new possibilities and to remain open to the fact that how we know and what we know may not be the only way and can in fact enact violence upon marginalized others. As Kat really beautifully um, described, academic scholarship is attached to material structures. So the scholarship like, um, that we do takes place in a very hyper-competitive, hyper neoliberal framework where we're pitted in hierarchies against each other, where competition is the name of the day and the order of the day, where we have very difficult funding models. And also we're kind of in, introduced to this idea of academic productivity where, you know, you have to publish or perish. And also in the way we teach students, for example, um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of criticism um, among feminists and other critical pedagogy scholars about how grading actually reproduces these kind of neoliberal hierarchies that link us to the marketplace rather than encouraging real in-depth pedagogy and thinking about pedagogy in a kind of more liberatory, emancipatory way that we might hope to do as feminist scholars. And also um, something I'm working on at the moment is the way that the way that these neoliberal structures can, to some extent, arguably kind of render us hypocrites in the academy because our scholarship becomes non-performative. And Sarah Ahmed uses this um, um, in the 2004 article, which is talking about equality, diversity, and institutional structures. He means this not in the kind of social media colloquial sense that gets used today. So the speech act is performative when it does what it says it does. So when something's non-performative, it doesn't do what it says what it says it does. So if our texts and if our scholarship are kind of non-performative, they're kind of rendering us partially the critical because of the structures of neoliberalism that we're interviewing up again. And our scholarship becomes less effective. It's kind of drained of its power, drained of its, its, of its kind of literary potential. Again, I'm thinking about metaphors of predation here. And finally, black feminist activists like the often quoted Audrey Lord emphasize how we need to transform silence into language and action. But I think in the contemporary moment, there is a special, a special focus that needs to be had on the action. Language alone doesn't really get us to liberation. It has to be combined with praxis, with kind of reflexivity, with looking at our embodied social and institutional positions and also acknowledging the kind of violence and the way that limitations of our academic framework actually can kind of stop us doing what we think we're doing in academic spaces and stop us from doing the kind of work that we want to do or that we think it's possible to do. And that's really my closing publication. All right, I'm going to see if I can uh, manage to get this partial transcript off the screen. Because I'm really enjoying how it spells my name. <laughs> uh, but I mispronounced my own last name, so I feel like that probably is well deserved. Um, okay, so let me bring up the slides for the last presentation and then I will introduce it. All right, let's.
see. So we're going back to share. Right? I can do this. I think I'm people. Oh, there. Nothing more nerve wracking than trying to do something on a computer <laughs> with a room full of people watching you. I mean, at least it's not a Windows computer because then I just couldn't do it. Um, so I think that this will be perfectly fine. All right. So then I'm going to go to the slideshow, play from the start. Okay, there we go. Um, then I'm going to introduce Dr. Iko. Okay, I can't do it. And since I mispronounced my own last name, help me out here. Hold the kitty. That's close to what I would have done. Hold the kibbe, right? Okay, close. Okay. Anyway, um, who is assistant professor of women, peace, and security in the gender studies department at London School of Economics? Um, and I won't read the title on the slide because then I would just be taking up space. So I will turn over the floor to you. Okay, thanks so much, Laura. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to see you, um, as well as everybody online. I hope you can hear me. Okay, I have no idea where the microphones are in this room, but. Um, I'm sure somebody will complain if they can't. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure for me to be on this panel with um, Kavita and with Kat and with Laura. And I wanted to extend the apologies from my colleague, Dr. Sadie Waring, who's also at LSE Gender Studies and who was meant to be here today, but had unforeseen childcare commitments and so couldn't make it. Um, I also wanted to thank Justine Carr and Violet Fox for all their labor in, in bringing us all together, which is which is always more work than we think it's going to be. Um, so thank you for doing that. Um, so the theme that I'm going to speak to today is largely about feminist failures, and I'm going to talk about it in relation to feminist knowledge production and particularly how in the course of research that I conducted within military institutions, I've often felt that this knowledge production process betrays feminist politics um, and, and kind of talk my way basically through those anxieties and what they mean. Um, and I'm gonna explain more about what I mean in just a moment, but I wanted to note that, note at the outset that this theme of feminist failure is, is sitting particularly heavy um, these past, past weeks. Um, and I'm, of course, referring to the magnitude of violence that's unfolding in Gaza as we speak and the quite simply unbearable human cost of it. Um, and of course, recognizing that the current situation has to be understood in, in the context of a, of a longer um, situation of colonization and apartheid. Um, and, and I just bring that up because in the face of these kind of large scale violence um, that's so immediate, I'm finding it very difficult to think about the kind of the subtler and less immediately obvious forms of violence and oppression um, that both militarization and resistance to military power can take. And that's kind of the topic of my research and of this paper. So that's sitting uncomfortably. Um, and I, I, I recognize that what we're witnessing is not new, right? That this is an intensification. Um, the current onslaught is an intensification of ongoing patterns of violence um, that have been omnipresent in Israel and Palestine, as well as in many other places in the world. So this isn't, we shouldn't take this as a surprise or as a radical departure from normal. Um, but, but kind of in this case, I guess what I could argue is that in order of cra to craft accounts of what we should do in the face of situations like this, um, it remains important to ask questions about how people come to be interpolated to take up these positions um, within institutions of violence and, and, and you know, in complicity with them and, and how they come to participate in these structures. Um, in other words, how complicity is really an extra remains unremarkable. But at the same time, this kind of analytical work feels wholly you know, insufficient. In, in moments of intense violence, um, but perhaps they remain important in, in imagining, in thinking about how we can imagine a world that is radically different, which is, of course, the point, um, which nonetheless sharpens one's feelings of failure. So that's that's the kind of backdrop against which I'm coming at this, this paper. Um, but so to talk about the particular forms of feminist failure, that I would like to address. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Thank you. Um, so the context of this talk is, is that I recently wrapped up a research project that took many, many years um, that interrogated the politics of providing gender training 
military and police peacekeepers. Um, and so this is the, the broader research project is the subject of my forthcoming book. Um, and this involved writing an ethnographic account of these kind of training, training courses, um, in which I sought to map what gender comes to do in these spaces, um, what, what military and police personnel across the world think gender is and does, um, and, and why it might be relevant to what they do, particularly in the context of peacekeeping. Um, and, and this involved that kind of work of charting the subjectivities that are involved. So, you know, in this training, who is it possible to be um, and what does that mean for how one acts um, and, and how these how these imaginaries dovetail with dynamics of 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 violence, of colonialism, of coloniality, of a heterosexism, but also how at times that training disrupts those kinds of logics. And, and might affect some kind of shift. Um, so, so largely speaking to the kind of question of that I mentioned earlier of how people have become interpolated into these institutions. And so in the course of this research, I spent a good amount of time basically hanging out um, or doing participant observation on military training courses, which lasted from a day to two weeks, which were residential courses in which people come from all over the world. Um, to spend two weeks together, and as well as conducting some interviews, and and the experience of, and and so these are these are usually held. The courses involved military, civilian, and police personnel, but they were generally held in military institutions. Uh, so so I have a paper in which I, I'm attempting to reflect on what that experience of hanging out in these spaces as somebody who's endeavoring to do feminist research was like. Um, so to make this point more concrete, can we have the next slide, please? Uh, the incident, um, I wanted to share a bit with you about the incident that started off these reflections. So I was observing a course in a Western European uh, military establishment. And on one day during the course, I was standing around during a coffee break, talking with people. And the course director, uh, we'll call him Hans, not his real name, Came kind of running up to me to talk to me about something. And I remembered something I had learned earlier. So I said to him, never run, Hans. It scares the troops. And he started, this was early on in the course, and this made him laugh because this is kind of a military officers. They actually say never run, it scares the men, but I couldn't quite bring myself to say that. Um, <laughs> so I changed it to this, and then Hans thought that was funny. Um, there's, a, there's a certain gender dynamic for here, right? How it's like cute that I would say that, um, and the assumption that I wouldn't know that. So he, he asked me, you know, who taught you that? How did you get to know that? And, and that was something that helped us establish a rapport, which anybody who's done ethnographic work or interviews knows can be quite important, right? Um, to have a rapport with your research partners. At the same time, this provoked a huge anxiety, right? Because it meant that I was thinking, you know, had I gone too far? In, in becoming familiar with how this institution works and you know had I allowed myself to become militarized, which is a which is a particular preoccupation of a strand of feminist theory, theory especially in international relations, right? Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. The theoretical context in which this made me uncomfortable is a piece that many of you might know. It's Carol Cohn's 1987 piece, Sex and Death in the Rational World of Defense Intellectuals, where Cohn talks about her experience of conducting field work among US um, defense intellectuals who work on military weapons. And, and she talks about what she describes as mechanisms of the mind's militarization, about how hanging out in the space necessitates learning to speak the language of that space. Um, and in relation to that, she says that, you know, that the troubling thing was that it was enjoyable. And she says, talking about nuclear weapons is fun. I'm serious. The words are fun to say. They're racy, sexy, snappy. Some of us may have spoken with a self-consciously ironic edge, but the pleasure was there nonetheless. Part of the appeal was the thrill of being able to manipulate an arcane language of being somebody in the know. So this piece has, I think, provided guidance to a whole generation of feminist scholars who work on these questions. So my anxieties will be similar, will be familiar to many feminists who research these questions 
of military power from a you know from an oppositional stance, right? I want to make that very clear. So seeking to investigate military power with a view of resisting it. Um, and so the anxieties provoke this question that's ongoing of what happens to our political practice and to our modes of knowledge production when we enter military spaces. And so next slide, please. So the next, so the first half of this paper takes as its, you know, focus how entering physically as a person, um, as a feminist researcher into military institutions, um, how one becomes subject to a certain set of norms and behavioral expectations. And I'm talking about this in the language of co-optation of how one becomes co-opted into these institutional norms. And the starting off point here is that to do this kind of ethnographic research, of course, requires negotiating action, access into these institutions. And this is something that's well documented in the literature. It will likely come as no surprise that security institutions are kind of paranoid by design. They don't like outsiders um, being, being there, especially civilians, women, foreign nationals, um, all of these things. So it, it can be a tricky process to get in there in the first place. Um, and so acquiring this access, whether through formal or informal channels and, and establishing rapport with one's research participants necessitate, necessitates a certain set of performances to be able to get in there and to have these conversations. Um, and these are the performances whereby the feminist researcher becomes subject to a set of disciplinary techniques um, that military institutions use. And, and these techniques are kind of both embodied and psychic. And I wanted to give a couple of examples. The first one is the moment of physical entrance into these spaces, which is very clearly demarcated. And I've given you on the slide here a quote from um, a book by Catherine Wright, Matthew Hurley, and, and Jesus Ignacio, who talk about you know doing research with NATO and and they have this evocative description where they say we have sought to get behind the barbed wire fences, the concrete crash barriers and the security checks. So there's something that's quite remarkable about this entrance into the institution. So in order to get into these places, the researcher must declare herself at the gate. Um, she has to have her identity documents ready and obtain a visitor's badge. So this is the first test, right, of whether you can enter and be accepted into the norms of the institution. So you need to be somebody who has identity documents and who knows that you need to have them with you to obtain access. You have to demonstrate that you know somebody on the inside um, and then you have somebody who's invited you and placed your name on a list. And even with all these formal requirements, this isn't always a straightforward process. A lot of the times I did this, you know, these the guards at the gate have 10 lists and they look at one and they go, no, you're not on the list. So it requires, the ability to act with a certain sense of entitlement and says, no, actually, I've been invited and I need you to check again, please. Right. So there's a certain performance of kind of insisting that you're somebody the institution should take seriously to get in in the first place. Um, and as part of that. One starts to act the part in certain ways that, you know, emulating, you know, seeing people stride past with confidence and trying to look like them so that you could, you could be treated, um, so that you could be accepted, accepted into the fold. Um, and, and so this, this moment I thought was emblematic of some of the ways in which one starts to adjust one's behavior. Uh, but of course, the process of embodied military discipline continues once you're inside the institution. So first of all, the researcher must adapt to military time. This is an institution that takes time very seriously, and a lot of military officers are trained that to be five minutes early is being five minutes late, <laughs> because you're supposed to be in a place 10 minutes before you're at the time. One of the courses I observed, um, which seemed very archaic, considering we all have phones now that automatically update the time, but we all had to synchronize our watches <laughs> at the start of this course. I mean, the course was indoors with, you know, materials that we're familiar with, with PowerPoints and flip charts, but we had to synchronize our watches to make sure that we were all on time there. Um, and so in order to maintain the rapport with the people you're working with, it requires that you are also on time because they will be very annoyed if you're not. Um, there are things that happen like a general enters a room, everybody's expected to stand up. These kind of behaviors that one is policed for. 
um, and that, you know, are, are required to be there. Uh, I've put on the slide as well a picture thinking back to Cohn's um, kind of admitting a certain pleasure to this. There are also ways in which one gets a signal that you're accepted. So at the end of the courses, you often get this kind of coin um, from the course as a token that you've been there, um, certificates of appreciation or of, of, um, of participation, things like that. So you wind up with this. I now have a box of paraphernalia acquired from these courses that I don't really know what to do with, but I took a picture of some of them. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. So this is a small selection of, of kind of different ways in which I realized I had moderated my behavior as part of this research and that made me uncomfortable because if these examples seem really mundane, that's exactly the point that I'm trying to make. Um, and I'm thinking here in a Foucauldian mood, who, of course, Michel Foucault wrote a lot about military discipline and the production of docile bodies. Um, and, and so reading this section from Discipline and Punish really, um, can we go back, please? Um, oh, oh sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, really resonated or, or really made me worried about what was happening because in it, Foucault talks about small acts of cunning endowed with great power of diffusion, subtle arrangements, apparently innocent, right? So we're not being asked to like say that we agree with the idea that martial force is the solution to all manner of problems, including conflict related sexual violence. Um, we're, not, we're not being asked to make these kind of large political shifts. Um, they're apparently innocent, but profoundly suspicious mechanisms that abate economics too shameful to be acknowledged or pursued petty forms of coercion through a multiplicity of minor processes. So hence why these small things um, make me and many other feminists feel anxious. Um, so next slide, please. So here is, I've, I've just collected a selection of references of other people who have grappled with similar kinds of questions. So Harriet Gray, for example, observes how her traditional gender presentation um, and the ways in which the gatekeepers who facilitated her access to the military institution read her class positioning in the UK context, both lent themselves to the perception that she was unthreatening to the institution and somebody who fit in with the norms. Um, and then there's a clear parallel there, right? So I, I reflected on the fact that my availability for co-optation is, is directly linked to, you know, being a being a cis woman, um, somebody who often passes as white, um, and and you know, being read as traditionally feminine means that one's one's performance doesn't subvert the norms of the institution. Um, it could rather it signals conformity with its standards. And then I've included this idea of the good girl and the feminist who can, who has a sense of humor, right? Because like playing into that idea of military hu humor, perhaps speaks against some stereotypes of the angry feminist, right? So my entry into this institution was, was um, premised on being perceived as unthreatening and in agreement with Gray's analysis, my availability for and acquiescence to these disciplinary techniques signals the ways that our gender performances uphold the traditional norms of the institution. So in this sense, the more radical prominence of feminism as disrupting traditional gender norms was co-opted. Um, further, by evacuating from view the violence that inheres the organization's mandate, such forms of co-optation can be understood as, as playing into the microphysics of power. Right, so, so what I'm focusing on here, right, is, is, is that microphysics of power rather than large political shifts. Um, and then and, and admitting that they can or feeling anxious about the about the political work that they're doing. And I'm using the term anxiety very specifically. Right. It's not a fear that has, a, you know. One doesn't exactly know what's going to happen as a result of this. Right. That there's not an object that's attached to this discomfort or that's clearly visible. 
But in the last bit of the paper, what I want to do is reflect on some ways, if we're going to attach importance to these kind of microphysics of power, and, and you might argue that we don't need to, um, but if we're going to take them seriously, then perhaps there's scope for taking seriously the reverse of that, because of course, being a feminist researcher in these institutions is a, is a weird fit, and that's a two-way street. So next slide, please. Um, so in equally diffuse ways, right, the presence of the feminist researcher is a disruptive space, and this is something that Annika Consul talks about as well, about how being a civilian woman in a military institution is something that gets noticed, that people will ask, who's that and what are they doing here? Um, and I've put up this picture on the slide partially for that, because you can kind of immediately tell how one might stand out in, in the space. Um, and, and sometimes that's, that's explicit. So on one of the courses I observed, uh, which is actually the picture here, a young male officer whose who's face I blanked out and who I'll call Tom, showed me the PowerPoint of a presentation his group was working on. They were doing kind of group work and had to do presentations. And he showed me the PowerPoint very quickly and said, you know, do you have any advice or any, any input on what we should have in this? And this PowerPoint had like 20 slides, all of which had pictures on them. And then I thought, well, maybe you could include a picture with a woman in it. <laughs> Which is like a very complicated analytical point, but I thought, you know, I'm going to say it anyway. And in response to this, Tom kind of looked at me and said, like, you would say that. <laughs> and I, being an academic, of course, went away and massively overthought this interaction. <laughs> <laughs> Let me share that with you. Because I thought, you know, if Tom already knew that I was going to say that, then why didn't he say that? Mm -hmm. You know, if Tom already knew what I was going to say, then why did he ask? If he kind of dismissed me with this chuckle of like, he would say that, why did he ask that? Um, was it to highlight something? Um, did he did he think that by bringing up the problem, I was the problem? I'm referring here, of course, to Sarah Ahmed's very influential idea of the feminist killjoy, who, who by naming the problem becomes the problem rather than the problem existing out there. Um, but also being a teacher, I did walk away and wonder, you know, I wonder if this guy thought about why I would keep insisting on that afterwards. I wonder if he went away and thought, you know, why am I so obsessed with this particular representational practice? Why does it matter? Um, but at the very least, for our purposes now, what I read from this encounter is that a feminist researcher in these spaces can be in a disruptive presence um, because they make points that you wouldn't otherwise be taking in. And there's other, even more indeterminate ways in which feminist researchers make their presence in military spaces disruptive. So I mentioned in terms of getting through the gate and so on, you know, emulating a certain standard of behavior. And, and one of the things I learned about was dress codes um, and that the military is obsessed with dress codes. And yeah, I'm going to wrap up in a moment. Um, so I figured out what the dress codes for civilians were and tried to, you know, more or less follow that. And, but then I also noticed, I came across several civilian women who were working in these spaces who had dyed their hair different unnatural colors, like pink and purple and, and so forth. And one of them told me, uh, the dress code doesn't mention the color of your hair. <laughs> it does say how you should wear it, you know, whether it's in a bun or, or neatly tied back or so on, but there's a loophole. And I loved that. And then I found myself as well as a researcher experimenting in color in different ways than I normally do. So I acquired, among other things, a magenta blazer. I have a pair of tangerine slacks that I don't fit into at the moment. Um, and, and, you know, I was kind of taking pleasure in, in being, in disrupting this visual landscape. And so this is where I'm kind of at with that thinking of, of what's going on here. Um, so I just wanted to bring up one point, so one more slide on this, is that, you know, I, I started out with that idea of failure and that being in these spaces, one often feels like one's failing feminist politics um, by, by going along with the discipline. But then there's also a sense of double failure in which you then subconsciously or consciously start kind of exceeding that, that discipline. Um, and dressing in funny colors or making points that, you know, people don't want to hear. 
And that reminded me of the concept of mimicry. Um, so in, in his 1984 essay, Homi Baba talks about the fact that um, mimicry is an ambivalent difference that's almost the same, but not quite. So the effect of mimicry on the authority of colonial discourse is profound and disturbing. What Baba is talking about, right, is when you're, there's a powerful norm and the colonized are, are compelled to imitate that norm, um, whether it's in terms of dress or manners or education, and yet they never, they're never allowed to fully inhabit it. They can never be the authentic thing. So there's always this excess, this thing that that it can't contain. So it's a difference that's almost the same, but not quite. And, and Baba turned it into almost the same, but not white. Right. So that there is and, and, and it's closely related to the form of mockery. Um, and I was thinking about what that means in these particular dynamics. And I actually had an experience where I gave a version of this paper with an audience where there were a few um, military officers from North America who got very, very angry with me about my, um, because I was disrespecting the institution by seeking to, you know, wear different kinds of colors or so forth. And it made me think that maybe that's not insignificant, that there is a politics to it. Um, but I think I'm going to wrap up there. I know I'm out of time. I'll just zoom out with my concluding questions, um, which is this is a work in progress. Uh, but I think thinking through this anxiety asks us asks broader questions, right, about where do we locate politics and possibilities for feminist knowledge production? Is it in addition to those kind of big moments of, of advocating for or against nuclear weapons or, or things like that? Is there something to be said about the everyday dynamics and microphysics of power? Are there politics there? Um, how does the process of doing research either enact or fail feminist political commitments? And then what to do with the submission of failure? Does that mean that one shouldn't do it? Um, and is is it an ethical stance to try and always be beyond reproach and never to have failed um, kind of theoretically pure commitments? So I'll leave it there. Thanks for letting me run over, which I think I have. Thank you. Thank you. I think that um, we're going to start our conversation among all of us in the room and have a little bit of conversation and then continue it at the refreshments after that. Does that sound like a good plan? Okay, maybe I can get our panelists to put themselves in these three chairs in front of the room. There's, we could bring the table. You, want the tables? Uh, you can have the table if you want. You don't have to have it if you don't want. Either one's fine with me. I have no engagement in governance of this sort. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I can just pick this one up. Okay. And I will stay uh, off screen, but we'll be we'll field questions um, as people get set up. Okay, uh, so if you have a question or a comment or a provocation and you're either in the room or online, raise your real or virtual hand and please introduce yourself as you ask your question. It goes like this. <laughs> um, well, while you are all being shy, I will take the chair's prerogative and ask the first question. Um, which is in, I was interested by the position knowledge played in each presentation, which was slightly different, but I think might have a conversation. And as somebody who's become something of a nihilist about the possibility of knowledge accumulation, um, <laughs> I feel like the three of you could differently convince me otherwise. So I was wondering if you'd take the opportunity to talk a little bit about the concept of knowledge across the presentations and maybe what you thought you had in common or not. Uh, yeah. Anybody interested in that question? I mean, I've got increasingly cynical about it too. Of the kind of knowledge that is 
rewarded and the kind of knowledge that is important but not necessarily rewarded in any of the academic structures that we have. I don't know if this is something that speaks to you. I, th I think there's a commonality, right, in terms of like where does knowledge reside? Yeah. Because I think we're all in different ways working on two tracks, right? Like there's the knowledge that's, you know, the product that here's my paper, mm -hmm. here's my book, that's what the institution sees and so on. But I think we kind of took this opportunity, right, to talk about knowledge that's kind of embodied that. or that's, you know, that's in our in our experience, but that we kind of figuring out what to do. I think we're also gonna... talking a bit about the trajectory of knowledge that you're supposed to have this nice, neat uh, research project, and here you go, you put your proposal in, then you do it, and it's all fine, and nothing gets, nothing weird gets thrown up, and you don't have some kind of existential crisis, and then you, then you write it up and you publish it, and then you get a nice book prize or something, and there's this trajectory that it's supposed to have, but in my experience, it very rarely does have. Yeah, I think we're, we're also talking about sort of the knowledge of the material conditions that we're in, mm. and the stages that we're almost, I guess, forced to inhabit because of these like neoliberal conditions. And also, um, I'm reminded of something I heard um, an academic called Hari Raman say at SOAS years ago, um, which said, you know, Revolution is not going to happen necessarily in the classroom, it's going to happen in the amalgamation of great political forces. Like the knowledge that we are producing isn't necessarily going to be directly to the kind of outcomes that we want, but we are nonetheless involved in the struggle in some way. I really liked this idea that I saw from someone that was an anti CV that was basically here are all of the things that I tried out that didn't work. So here's a project that I designed, didn't go anywhere. Here's a chapter that I thought I'd submit, missed the deadline. So it was, it was like this, this almost like a shadow CV of things that they tried but didn't work. And I think it's important to recognise that as well. That's part of, sorry, that's part of the work in a way. Yeah. And I think what's between the lines for us is feminist work. To me, at the moment at least, it's almost more interesting than the actual theoretical mm. work, like what we're not saying in the paper or the kind of formal conference that we're actually talking about behind the scenes, the kind of political conversations we're having about the politics of being in the academy and all the problems that it entails. That's, I think, in a way, almost more important than the product at the moment, I think. Yeah, I'm really interested in how you do this with, with military organisations. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm just so interested in how someone kind of ends up studying them as a feminist, because I think it's important, but there must be so many different things to that you have to reconcile with yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And it also, which raises the interesting question, right, of also like what makes, because we have this title of feminist knowledge production, mm -hmm. like what makes it particularly feminist? Is it the feminist subject? Is it that, you know, that that's who you want? Who you, you know mm -hmm. aspire to be or or like the qualifications of the knowledge itself but it also becomes so much messier once you're in it as well because one of the things that I took away especially depends on the spaces you're in right but because military organizations in different parts of the world are very are very different and mm -hmm. like when you talk to people within them they have very different accounts of of why they're there, yeah. ranging mm -hmm. depending on location, right? Like ranging from there's great adventure training and opportunities to do skiing and things like <laughs> that to like wanting yeah. to serve one's country or kill bad guys to wanting to help people mm -hmm. of understanding the military as a humanitarian organization, which is an interesting, but mm -hmm. but it's it's absolutely the case to then you know it being a stable job with a predictable income in a, in a context where that is not available to a lot of people. So it makes it very also messy and difficult to talk about military subjectivities as a singular and as, mm. as um, yeah, that's, that was my main takeaway, I think, was, was it became very hard to, to, understand, to understand them as, you know, unintended uniform, right? 
I was at CENCOM one time in Tampa and I met a gentleman named Scud <laughs> and I asked him, I said, oh, that's a fitting nickname. What's your given name? That was it. <laughs> okay. I was like, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> that's the uniform one, right? You know, something that, yeah, kind of like, okay, you had a hand up. Yeah. Hi, I'm Catherine. I study gender development and globalization at LSE. And I had a question for you, Kat. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I know it's maybe not a short answer to this question, mm -hmm. but you're you're mentioning how when you're collecting data on marginalized people, for mm -hmm. instance, LGBTQI people, that you're making um, it visible and then easy for people to attack that data. But I'm also curious about carrying on with research on marginalized marginalized people, and especially in places where they might be criminalized and mm -hmm. um, coming out. So, like, how do you go on doing research on topics where those people, like, they are in danger if you're doing research on them? So, I've never been put in that position myself because I've largely been uh, researching representation, which is less talking, uh, talking to actual live subjects and more looking at, say, media sources uh, newspapers, I've recently worked on some newspaper comments and looking at how people outside that community represent them. Um, so I do know some people who are working with incredibly vulnerable LGBTQ communities and I think the first thing to do is make sure that any kind of anonymization protocols you have are incredibly tight. So that means not just changing someone's name, but also changing locations, uh, yeah, locations in all of its forms. So including things like workplaces or universities or departments, but also uh, one of the things they found is that sometimes people would kind of give navigational aids and you obviously don't want to keep that in your data because you might be in just basically, yeah, this is how you find this underground queer club. So you need to be really careful about taking out stuff like location, taking out anything that could be identifiable, but then you that is a compromise. You do then lose some of the nuance of that specific geographical time and place and context. So it is a tricky one. I think for me, Ethically speaking, if I was working, if I had the opportunity to work on a population that was under such severe threat, I'd have to think incredibly carefully about whether to do it in the first place. And then also, as soon as possible, involve people from within that community and say, is this a project that helps you? So is this a project that you would be involved in and help and guide me and the project and work on it yourselves but also is this a thing that should happen at all and I think sometimes I think sometimes we do get a bit dazzled by oh my god this is such an under-researched population and sometimes the population wants to be under-researched so sometimes having that Kind of having that uh, invisibility is actually protective. Um, so a few more questions. Uh, let's see, Kat, you had a question, and then I don't know your name. Let's take three questions in a row and then uh, answer them. Um, hi, I'm Kat. Um, I'm doing a PhD at Royal Holloway um, in criminology and politics. Um, questions to anyone who wanted to ask so, um i guess it, it kind of goes on with producing kind of um feminist knowledge production how is that impacted when for example i mean i would identify as a queer feminist but my i i actively dilute that for my area of research because i think it would change what i got and so i guess does that still make it feminist knowledge production if i'm actively going out of my way to not have people necessarily think about when they saw me, or um, I guess it's kind of just the, the levels of what that is. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Paula, I'm doing social policy and master's at the LSE. 
Um, my question is also addressed to the three of you. Thank you very much for that, those presentations. But it draws on something that I can mention. And it's, um, I love when you touched upon the fact uh, that a way that men or anti-feminist people will try to minimize or the issues that we're raising is that they will say that when we are naming the problem, we are creating it rather than the problem being there and just putting it out. So I wanted to ask you whether you felt that or you whether you actually thought that there were some gaps of knowledge or there was something in your research that maybe um, the backlash that was going to get was not worthy of for it. Like has it ever happened to you where you were like, maybe if I bring this issue up and I include it in my literature and I research this topic, I'm going to get more attack and how people think that I'm seeing a problem where there is none. You're, you can feel like you're creating a problem by bringing a social issue to light and create like feeling a gap where there was actually nothing on it. Yeah. And there's one more question here. My name is Carmen. I have a question for the data. Um, it's on the kind of on more of a comment. Um, I'm thinking like on of segregation. Um, and thinking to reference uh, Dr. Mignolo in his life, and I'm not sure if, if people here know because I know that he's quite a, a prominent colonial scholar in, in Europe and in North America, but in Latin America, he's quite known for like, sexual harassment and um, and also for appropriating. Don't produce the knowledge in English and um, yeah, because it is difficult to be so part of the canon. Okay, anybody want to tackle these questions? These easy questions, right? First, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. can I answer that last one? So, I actually love that you brought that up. Um, I had heard about that. There are so many important theorists in the canon about in sort of feminist, queer, and post queer literature who have you know, turned out to be super problematic. And that's so interesting to me. That's part of what I'm getting at because it's like, who are these people creating these really powerful texts that we seem to need, but they aren't doing what they say they're doing? Like, how is this being incentivized and how is it happening across the board? Like, there are so many examples of this um, among feminist <coughs> and racist. Um, queer scholars, and I just yeah I find that fascinating, and um, it's it's something that we need to be talking more about in terms of the politics of citation, and it also kind of begs the question like to what extent do we need academic theory in order to um to do the work of the laboratory struggle like how is it helping? I think it's really open question. I'll speak to the question backlash. I think it goes across both of our because Kat, mm. you were talking about the environment yeah. that we're working in, and we know that there's a huge. I mean, there's some debates around whether backlash is is the correct term to mm -hmm. because if we can understand this as a productive movement, right? It's an anti-gender, anti-liberatory politics movement, um, and and it's very keenly felt in in the context that we work in, and on particular, but like. And I guess it speaks to the fact that this is a productive movement that is organized in particular ways. So it's not that there's something inherent to talking about gender or doing this kind of work that provokes a backlash everywhere it goes. It shows how like these networks are mobilized mm -hmm. in particular because interestingly, most of the military courses I was in, they love gender. Um, partially because it's not, they think it's not feminist. About women, so like there's there's a particular gender is made to do thing. gender is made to do a particular kind of work, or the kind of radical nature of it is not seen as threatening in the. So I, I have that reference to Cindy Weber's idea of being good girls, because when I started taking those paper, I said like, oh, you, you need the institutions to take you seriously, and then I was like, who am I kidding? The institutions are taking me seriously. Um, we're not assimilating. That's not what's going on here. It's about being perceived as unthreatening, right? So some of this, when I say that it's not about large political shifts, I was on one military training course in the Nordic region, and they had a debate about gender equality, and as part of that was because Nordic countries have conscription, so part of that was should conscription be extended to women, 
isn't that the gender equal thing to do? Um, and I said, no. And they were like, well, what, how do you square that? And I said, I don't think we should have conscription. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, how do you, but then how do we maintain a military? And I said, I don't think we should have a military. <laughs> and I did not get kicked off the course. And actually, in that particular participant observation, I was asked to do work on the course. I was like facilitating small groups mm -hmm. and so on. But that wasn't a problem. That wasn't a deal breaker for them that I was sitting there saying, I don't think we should have militaries. Um, which I don't think is because they agreed with my analysis. I think it's because they couldn't take it seriously that it would merit any kind of response but that's what some of the when he talks people who are trying to do gender work in these spaces they say that they're using that as not being seen as so threatening or so on to be able to do things that they otherwise wouldn't and fighting small pockets of resistance but i think yeah my response to that question tells us something about the anti-gender movements that we do see as something that are specifically fabricated and you know organized and and very very organized and not as something that emerges as a as an inevitable reaction. Yeah, I mean the thing that I've been in kind of in dialogue with scholarship that monitors these these networks. So they're very much not they're kind of like fungi in a way. Uh, in that it's I this has an argument, okay? <laughs> so it looks like these things are just popping up out of nowhere. And that suddenly, oh, here we've got a cluster of this stuff, and we've got some over here and some over here. But actually, they're connected by this web that you don't nest, that isn't visible, but which is there and it, which is sustaining these different clusters. So they are in dialogue with each other in a way that isn't readily apparent. And I think that that's why they are hard to, to track in a sense. Because you're never quite sure, is this an actual organic response or is this something that has been kind of fed and nurtured by something else? Would you, yeah, am I, from, does the fungi metaphor work? I'm apologetic for laughing at it. Thank you. I feel like I need to come up with some kind of forest metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that that's part of the backlash that, or backlash in that. There are kind of there are different interpretations and different understanding of it depending on what exactly you can see. Does that make sense? So are you just seeing the mushrooms or are you aware of the this web connecting them underneath? And you could also talk about like how that web extends into the academy as well. And mm -hmm. I think there's sometimes it's like a false distinction between what happens in research and in academic spaces and what happens outside of them. So in terms of backlash in my own research, I yeah, so because I was researching sort of I did my PhD in study of religions. Because I did my master's degree in gender studies at the LSE actually years ago, about 10, 10 13 years ago. Um, but when I was doing my PhD, there were a lot of feminist scholars within the study of religions prominent scholars who would come up to me and try and dissuade me of the fact that I had anything interesting to say about the goddess movement, about women's spirituality. It was like, you know, of course the goddess movement is empowering to women. Why are you even asking this question? Like, why are you trying to take down women's idea about divinity? This shouldn't even be asked. Um, I remember like sitting um, at a conference breakfast once, like I said I was like questioning the whiteness of the goddess movement. And someone said to me, well, there's nothing to see there. Like, there's, there's nothing to say there. All you can say about it is very white. There's nothing to say in that. What, what are you trying to say? And there was just this complete shutting down of any kind of discussion of race in these sort of white feminist spaces, like not only in my research context and my, my research site, but also within the academy and in the study of religions and in the feminist study of religions in particular. Actually, that reminds me that when I was looking for a job before, you know, Royal Holloway kind of through me a bone. <laughs> uh, I basically used my job interview talk as a way of testing the department because I put the I research transphobia and I think trans people should exist, right? <laughs> and I think trans people should be able to live long and happy and fulfilling lives front and center in my talk. And it was a way of testing the department of if they hated my research and if they just thought it was terrible and shouldn't exist and so on, then the chances were that that wouldn't have been a good department for me. 
And if by some miracle they'd absolutely hated the fact that I worked on transphobia and, you know, thought trans people are good, actually, that and somehow miraculously still offered me a job, I probably wouldn't have taken it because I'd know I don't think this department would actually be supportive. So in a way, it can be a way of of also testing out your reception. Okay, one time at a job interview, I gave my whole job talk and somebody said, oh, that was awesome. So when are you going to work on something beyond gender? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, there's an earlier airplane. <laughs> <laughs> We're just like, peace, guys. <laughs> there is a hand up over here. Maybe we'll take one more round of questions. Oh, there was someone's question about. Um, you, you were leading into it, right? Around. You were yeah. saying about masking your feminist commitments in your yeah. work. I actually thought that that spoke to Kavitha's work on can you separate the text from its author? So if you're writing a, what turns out to be a feminist text, but without specifically identifying yourself as a feminist. Is it still a feminist text? I wonder if you meant, like, did you, were you talking about a particular research context where you were kind of expected to disclose yourself or was there something specific to that? No, I think it, it, it kind of, uh, so my area of research is specifically uh, policing house terrorism. Um, and it's, I don't know, I just, in previous research I've always just tried to really dial down who I am as a person because I just don't think it's I don't I don't think it would get the appropriate results and I guess does it still count then if it's, as feminist knowledge production if even though I am a feminist if I haven't approached it in the the correct way or the way that I don't know I think there's a difference between the the like the right way to do it theoretically knowledge justice but then also the way that you think is going to actually work I guess is my question. I, I see a lot of resonances and you can tell me whether that's accurate or not but like especially with literature that I've engaged with and people I've engaged with who work as gender experts in patriarchal institutions who say that they're kind of a lot of them describe themselves as Trojan horses or so on basically trying to sneak feminism into the institution without calling it feminism and then kind of talking through the dilemmas of that. I came across a lot of them for, for this particular research where they say, like, I would never say in the app now except that I'm a feminist or talk about patriarchy or so on because everybody would be shut down. And then, you know, I'm, I think I can still get them to make changes mm -hmm. if I don't do that, like from a pedagogical perspective. And something I found interesting thinking about it, um, <clears throat> going back to um, Adrian Rich's bit on why. That women have been lying to men throughout history to keep themselves safe, but her caution is that we must never forget that we're lying and bring that as a weapon into relationships with people who don't have power over us. And I thought that was a helpful way of thinking about the dynamic of these gender experts of, of kind of constant, doing that constant work of reminding yourself of what it is, you know, that there are different genres of writing and yes, you may, or, or teaching or so on, and that yes, you may be saying these things packaged in a way that the audience can understand and get on board with, but if that's not, you know, a full account of how you feel like that there's basically sitting with the discomfort of that was, was by that some of them were, how they were navigating that tension. So I'm being told that our refreshments are feeling abandoned. Oh, we're okay. mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking maybe we can break the conversation down to being informal, where you have refreshments and continue the conversations. And as we go out, I both want to thank uh, Vivian and Josephine and Cavada and our panelists and everybody who's here for a wonderful time. And hopefully we'll continue the conversations with things that are nice for us to eat and drink. <laughs> so thank you.